Today's class is going to be on getting ready for Rosh Hashanah. Now, we, we, all, we all have gone through Rosh Hashanah for, for many, many years. Uh, and uh, to be very honest, once we look very deeply into Rosh Hashanah, we find that it's a very confusing day. Very confusing day. Um, let's give a few examples in order to really get clarity of why we are, what are we preparing for ourselves? Right now we're in Yumei Elul, the time, the month just before Rosh Hashanah, Tishri, and we're preparing to get into Rosh Hashanah, which is the big Yom Adin, the big time that we're being judged. But we have to understand that Yom Adin properly in order to be able to prepare for it. Because if we're preparing for something that we're not, we don't really know about, we think we know about it, then we're, the preparations are going to be useless. Okay, so let's try to understand the Yom Adin, the Day of Judgment. Now, these, this Day of Judgment, Rosh Hashanah, these 48 hours, because we, we hold two days of Rosh Hashanah, it's probably the most important day of our life, if not of the year. Because we know that all the person's panasa is built on these two days. That's how important it is. That's how important it is. And, and we know that the panasa will come and will affect that person's year, and that year will affect the next year, and next year, and next year, and next year. So, theoretically speaking, that this Rosh Hashanah coming up, 24, 48 hours that you'll be spending in, in shul, those 48 hours will be the most important days of your entire life. We can say it like that. Now, we have to understand, we call it the Yom Adin because it's a judgment day. The judgment day. Jem, Hashem looks at all of our acts and then judges them to see if we're worthy of Panasa for the next year. Mizonat, Mizonot Shel Adam. Everything that we need will be for the next year. We decide it. Now, that's an incorrect way to look at things. Now, I'll tell you why. Because if we're looking at it as a judgment, purely as a judgment, it's a Yom Adin, it's, it's, it's a Yom of Judgment, but if we're looking at it purely as a Yom of Judgment, Yom Adin, that in every court of law, and this is, we, we establish our courts of law in this world according to how they are in the, in the, in the world Olama Elyonim, in the, the spiritual worlds. And the way Hashem organizes His courts is that you have a judge, which is Hashem. You have a defender, which are the Malachim, the good angels. And then you have the prosecutors, prosecuting angels, which, which is the Satan. <coughs> and they judge a person. Now, us being the person being judged... We know you can go to any court, you'll see what happens is that the person being judged is allowed the power of speech. He's allowed to say what he's done wrong, and he's allowed to justify himself by giving arguments, saying what, why he did why he did. Now, in this particular, and also to regret and, and ask for mercy to the judge in order to get his sentence shortened or whatnot. But, the, but the, the person being judged, he has to be given the power of speech. The right of speech, I should say. Now, in this judgment, Yom Adin, Rosh Hashanah, we have no speech. Because the way we do it in Jewish, in the Jewish law, is that we have a concept called, Jewish religion, I should say, we have this concept called Vidui, Tachanun. We, in English, it's called confession. In confession. So... Um, what we do the entire year is that we confide in Hashem that what we did, we recognize that it's wrong, and we do teshuvah. We, do, we return to Hashem, we said, please Hashem, make things right for us. And then some magically, somehow magically Hashem makes it good for us. But in Rosh Hashanah, we don't find any confession whatsoever. Any confession. We don't find any notice that we're allowed, and it's the opposite that we are not allowed to cry on Rosh Hashanah. You know, we're not even allowed, there's, there's um, a custom that says we're not even allowed to eat nuts. Nuts. You know, why? Because egos, because if you take the gematra of egos, it turns out to be chet, is, 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 uh, we don't even want to, uh, in any way, to show 
any real any relationship with us and doing a sin. We don't even nuts. And and therefore it's very confusing. What's more perplexing that we find in Tanakh, in Nehemiah and Ezra, when they came back from Babel, when they were exiled, and they go back from the, they were exiled from Israel to to to, to Babel, and then back into Eretz Yisrael. When they first got back, it was Rosh Hashanah time. And Nehemiah starts talking to the congregants over there, all the Jews, and he said, we had a hard time in Baba and Exa, but now we're back to our where we are, now we have to do Teshuvah, and he starts, ex, ex starts um, dashing everything that person has to do to come back close to Hashem now that we've been allowed to enter the, the, the land of Israel. And what does the, the Pesukim say in Tanakh? They say that everybody started crying. Everybody started crying and regretting what they did because they obviously they did something wrong. They were exiled and now they're coming back to make amends with Hashem. So the Psukin says something interesting that he stopped them in the tracks and said, Stop crying. Stop crying. And it was Rosh Hashanah. Stop crying. Go home. Eat a, uh, eat a large meal and be besimcha and send gifts to your friends mishloch lereehu and please don't cry now that is so strange now just imagine a rabbi gets up in in, in for, for drush and rosh hashanah and he starts telling everybody um uh, we gotta get prepared. This is the Yom Adin. It's a scary time over here, and and he starts laying on, you know, this fear factor business that the, we, we Jews always like to do. You know, it's it's built in our system. This fear factor. We're really scared when we come to Rosh Hashanah. We're petrified, and and everybody, everybody, all, all imagine all the congregants start crying and everything, and 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 regretting it. And he stops them in mid truck He says, "Oh wait, this went all wrong." I'm really sorry about this. I didn't mean to make you cry. You know what? Uh, get the Kiddush. Get the Kiddush cups here. Let's make Kiddush. Let's have a party over here. Bring the Kiddush. Let's have a lot of food and this and that. That would be the strangest thing in the world. So what? The rabbi lost his mind. What do you mean? Uh, you, got, you got everybody in the right mood, right frame of mind over here. And now you're telling, this, telling everybody not to cry. Does it make sense? The crying would be very, 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 very pro appropriate for this time of the year, for this Yom Adin. But nevertheless, again, we find no mention, and it opposite, we're not allowed to cry, we're not allowed to confess our sins, we're not allowed to, to show any signs of mourning whatsoever. We are forced to dress like Shabbat. Onig Shabbat, we go, we're happy on Shabbat. We have to be as if it's Shabbat. Yom Tov, it's a Yom Tov. So what's going on? So it, it, we have this contradiction over here. It, are we being judged here for the entire year? And, 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 and therefore we have to admit that we've done things, unfortunately we've done things against Hashem's will. And therefore regret and did Teshuvah and, and therefore that would be more logical for us. On the other hand, we find that we're not allowed to do that. So how are we going to be judged? Is that fair that we're being judged without having a recourse of the... Um, a fair chance to to explain ourselves and to regret and do and, and, to, and to explain to Hashem uh, by doing chatanu and vidui and so on and so forth that that's the the main question we have to clear this up in order in order to come into Rosh Hashanah with the right frame of mind what are we trying to achieve on Rosh Hashanah it's not just tshuva 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 but there has to be a logical understanding of what's going on over here there's something else we have to understand as well that is very perplexing is that the highlights, the highlight of Rosh Hashanah, we all know is the Shofar. Now, Shofar seems to be an incredible um, instrument that through the Shofar, the rabbis tell us that everything is fixed up. Everything's fixed up. That means that all the cards are turned at that point in time. The rabbis tell us that what is the point of the shofar? Because we have, like we said, the prosecutor, the Samech Mem, the Satan, who's telling in front of Shem, oh, he did this, and she did that, and he did that, and they were bad, they were da 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 And all of a sudden, this magical shofar comes, boom, 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 
He falls on the floor, he stops uh, prosecuting us, and we're scot-free. Now, what does that mean exactly? What is this, a magic tool? Is a magic wand over here? How does that work exactly? And, and, and second of all, didn't, didn't the Santan, wasn't he here last year? Did he know what happened? So let's say it, it magically hits him on the head and, and, and he's, he's knocked out. Doesn't he take precautions? Is this the first Rosh Hashanah of, of his entire life? Remember, in, in, the, in the spiritual, spiritual world, there is no time. There is no time. So this is his one millionth Rosh Hashanah. I don't know. Oh, well, I can't say one million. But it's his 5,780th Rosh Hashanah. Thousands of Rosh Hashanah he's gone through. And every time we blow the Shofar, and he, go, he falls for it the whole time. Why didn't he go? He should know exactly when we're going to blow the Shofar. Put himself in a, in a very quiet room, soundproof room, not hear the Shofar, and come back out and say, Guys, I'm still here. Got you. You didn't get to me this year. What's going on with Shofar business? We have to understand, because this is the pinnacle of what Rosh Hashanah is trying to teach us. There's something we have to learn that we are, I think, we are missing in Rosh Hashanah. Now we have to understand that that Hashem, we see Hashem in two different ways, two paradoxical ways. We see this from the Nefesh Chaim. He points this out that there is one piece of the Zohar that tells us that Hashem surrounds the entire world. Saviv Kol Almin. He's everywhere. He, he, he is the creator. He is the master. He put this all together, this whole reality that we're living in. This not only this world, but all the worlds, all the universes. We're, we're, so far we only find that we we live in one universe, but that we we believe there are multiple universes and also spiritual universes as well. He created all. He's the master. He's the creator. That's one way. And then Hashem, and then there's another piece of Zohar that says, who that he's not only the outside force, Saviv Kol Almin, he's also in every single person's life. He's also in every single person's life. That's providence, that he leads and directs every person's life every single moment of the day. So the question is, is he out there or is he in here? We're not going to address that answer right now. There's many different answers for that. But the point is, <clears throat> he has those two perspectives, two paradoxical perspectives, that we, we address him, we relate to him as, he's over there, I'm over here. He's the creator, I pray to him. He is greater than me, obviously, and therefore I direct my press to him. And then there's another perspective that I live with him. He is within me. He is everything that is. There is nothing without Him. There is no space without Him. Mimali kol almin. Now those two perspectives are truly correct. And they're a little bit paradoxical, but again, we're not going to address that issue. But we have to address Hashem on both levels. Now what do I mean by this? Because if you think about it, it's very easy to address Hashem as the Creator. Because when you're doing that, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, what you're doing is that you're leaving all the problems with Him. Meaning that if anything goes wrong in your life, He did it. You know, why is He not giving me panasa? Why is He not giving me the shidduch that I need? Why is He not giving me that job that I need? Why did He not make me successful like Him or her? Why didn't I receive everything that I was supposed to receive, that I deserve? And so on and so forth. So we have complaints. You know, Hashem, I went to I went to the synagogue every single day. I, I, Hashem, I made sure that I I, I I made the challahs every single Shabbat, and I took challah and I did all the mitzvot that I was supposed to. I, you know, I have a whole checklist over here, a whole score that I'm keeping. You know what I mean? And I prayed very nicely over Rosh Hashanah, and I did everything you told me to do. So why am I not receiving what I'm getting? We find that Sadiq Ralo, Virasha Tovlo, we have all these contradictions. And sometimes we find good people are not getting what they're doing, what they're getting, bad things getting sent their way, these curveballs in life. And we find bad people doing billions of dollars in sales, making a lot of money, and everything seems to be fine in their life. So that's how we have the perspective of 
when we look at the perspective of he's there and he's controlling our lives, it's his ball game. And therefore, we got to do what we got to do to please him. If we go into Rosh Hashanah and we check all, check all the lists, he wants us to, 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 make it, to swirl a chicken over our head and do kaparot. I'll, I'll, I'll take any chicken. You want me to take a chicken? I'll take a chicken. I'll put it over my head. You want me to, to drink honey? Uh, no problem. I'll drink honey. What else you want me to drink? Um, anything, any, any sauce? I'll drink sauce if you want me to do. Is that is that, that, that we got to do? I have no idea what you want. Drink honey, put the chicken over my head. You know, stand up all day long and pray. I'll go. I'll pray all day long. Two days, you want two days, or three days, as long as I can get what I can get. Right? That's the trade off here. I'll do what you want, but you do what I want. Okay? That's how that's our perspective of what we go into Rosh Hashanah. We have a sort of a kindergarten understanding of that's the way it works. It's his game rules. We do what he wants, and then he pays us off. Okay? But is it really that way? Is it really that way? Because the point of Rosh Hashanah is mamlichim alecha, that we, we, we crown Hashem. On this day, we crown Hashem to be the king. Right? We crown Hashem to be the king. Now, let's think about this. Now, if Hashem is perfect in all His ways, and He's the ultimate master of all creations, and has everything, is not missing anything, does He need us to crown Him? And second of all, does he gain anything from us telling him that you're the king? He doesn't know he's the king. And why does he need us? Why does he need us to call him king anyways? Can you imagine, I, I tell this people, I tell this a lot to people. Imagine, imagine you walk out of your house and you got a whole line of little ants that every time you, pra you pass the threshold of your house, you leave the house, you know, these little ants are bowing down to you. So the first time you look at all these ants, you're going, wow, that's so cool. These little ants, they really, you know, the machshiv of me. They, they, they think I'm so, 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 such a cool person. I'm such an important person. They're all little bowing. And the, and the more, and the, the, as the days go by and the months go by, and these little ants, are there, you're gonna, you sort of get fed up with them. It's like, get out of my way. You're slowing me down. I'm late for work, late for school, late for yeshiva. And you sort of step over them, and you don't just, after a while, you just don't notice them anymore. We're like, who cares? The little ants are bowing down to you every single day, every time you walk out of the house. Where are these little ants? Where are these little grains of seeds, sand, grains of sand that are all bowing to Hashem or praying to Hashem? And he's like, like, do I need this? Do you think he needs this? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. So what's his point of Rosh Hashanah, the whole buildup, the whole fear factor? The Yom Adin, the judgment, where we're not allowed to speak out at all. We're not allowed to, to, to cry out and, and regret and, and pray to Hashem with Vidu and Tachanun. But rather, we have to go and nom coronate Him as our King, which again, He doesn't need. So we have to understand what's going on. That's one way to look at Hashem, that as the creator. The other way, as we said, is the providence. We look, we see Him as He is in our lives all the time. Now, that's a little bit more difficult. Now, let me tell you something interesting, that there are coaches that teach you everything about first impressions. First impressions are so crucial because people will remember you forever and ever to on a first imp impression. There are special coaches that teach you, you know, how to smile, how to, you know, say um, hello, how are you, introduce yourself in a correct way, and so on and so forth, because that will set the bar of who you are in their minds forever and ever. And, th and that's very important, especially in business and so on and so forth. What's Hashem's first impression on us when we first meet Him? Okay? The first impression was in Hasinai. And Hasinai, when He introduced Himself, He says, I'm Hashem. I'm Hashem. Now that's a good presentation. I'm Hashem. I'm Hashem. You know, the creator, the creator of everything. And then he says something. He says that I, who took you out of Mitzrayim? Took you out of Mitzrayim. Now, why didn't he say something better? He said, he should have said, I created Mitzrayim. Not only I created Mitzrayim, I created the entire world. Not only created the world, I created, I am the creator of all things. That would have been a better first impression. Why is, he t why is he downsizing himself by saying, you know what? I'm Hashem. Shalom Aleichem, I'm Hashem, and I took you out of Mitzrayim. 
okay, that's pretty cool. I, mean, I can't do that. I can't take people out of, of, out of a difficult situation. But he should have said something more grandiose, that I am the creator of all things that is and was and, and will be. Well, well, why is he downsizing himself? You know why? Because he's showing us that he is in our lives. Not that he just created the world and walked away like some religious religions believe, but rather he's with us every single time, every single moment of the day. And he was with us in Mitzrayim and he heard our pains and cries and helped us through Mitzrayim and took us out from Mitzrayim, put us into Mitzrayim, took us out of Mitzrayim, showing the providence that there is, that he's there all the time, not only the creator. So the second way of seeing Hashem is through providence. We see Him as in our lives, the way He introduced Himself to us. But we have little issues with that because, to be honest, we aren't always happy the way He's running the world. Isn't that true? I mean, do you always get what you want? Do you always get the, the right panasa? And, and, you know, by the way, your friend's making three times as much money as you are. Is that fair? not fair He's, we're equal we went to the same classes together we're still you know i go to the synagogue he goes to the synagogue so what, what's different from him to me why why is hashem favoring him and not favoring me or you're looking for shidduch why did he get married and why, or why did she get married and why didn't i get married why didn't i get my shidduch or anything everything that we're praying for why is they why are they much more healthy than we are we have medical issues and 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 Constantly have to go to the doctor and, and the hospitals. Is that a life? That's not a life. And we're complaining to Hashem all the time. All the time. Why, why, why? Now, is that the right way to be? Now, let's give the biggest example that we can from Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu was the opposite. He was what we call a chesed Jew. A chesed Jew. A chesed yid. Everything... He looked through the eyes of Chesed, through the eyes of Chesed. And Hashem knew that whatever tests he would send him, he would pass because he had the mindset of Chesed. Now, let me explain what this means. First, we have to understand Avon Avinu. Avon Avinu's whole life was built on a motto of not going to serve Avodah Zarah. He hated Avodah Zarah. He understood that Hashem Echad is only one Hashem. All these Avodah Zarah, all these idol worshipping, that wasn't the way to go. The way to go was to serve Hashem who created everything. Now one way to serve uh, idols was uh, a concept called the Molech. I don't know if you ever heard of the Molech. Molech was a concept very popular at that time, of Avinu's time, is that you would sacrifice your children to an idol. And through that, miracles would happen and you would receive everything that you want. They weren't stupid people. They knew what they were doing. But that was a magical ceremony. That was witchcraft. That was serving idols. That wasn't the way that Shem wanted for, for the people to live their lives. And Avraham Avinu's whole gusto, his whole raison d'être, the reason why he wanted to live and to follow Hashem was to negate everything and to go against this concept called molech to sacrificing your children sacrificing your children killing your children insane he said insane and his own total life was to 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 fight against this concept and try to teach people not to sacrifice the children and one good day after hashem has been pounding Avraham Avinu with test after test after test and his wife got kidnapped and he didn't have children and, and so on and so forth, test after test. And he finally gets his children, he gets wealth, and he's sitting back, and Avraham Avinu is top of his game, and, he, and, and Hashem speaks to him again. He said, yes, Hashem, what do you want? Anything you want, I'll give it to you. And Hashem turns around to him and says, you know, I just want one, just want, do one more thing for you. He says, yeah, anything you want, anything you want. He said, just kill your son. And he said, what, 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 what was that? So, could you just imagine what was going on there? You know, in his mind, he didn't really get it because... Again, his whole, his whole philosophy, his whole reason why he was alive to fight this concept of Molech not to kill your children and sacrifice them for our God. And now he's been asked now to sacrifice his only child that he waited his entire life, his only child, to sacrifice him for a God. What are people going to say? 
you know, headline, headline, Avam Avinu, hypocrite of the year, hypocrite of the, uh, of, of, of the day. He's sacrificing, he sacrificed his child for a god. Well, look at that. Mr. Hypocrite himself. And his whole thing was to make, his whole life was to make a Kiddush Hashem. And now he tells him, Hashem says, just kill your son. You know what Avraham Avinu said? You got it. You got it. I'm going to do it. What? What gave him the strength? What gave him the... It is like beyond human abilities at that point. This is beyond anything, we, any test that anybody can pass. Again, if, you're, if your philosophy for your entire life was one particular philosophy and somebody tells you to change it on a dime, you won't be able to because that is who you are. It's ingrained in your being. And you know conceptually and emotionally that this is wrong. To kill people is wrong. And to kill your son. And on top of that, offer it to, an, offer it to a god is the worst Chilul Hashem you could ever do. And it's the worst thing you could ever do to Hashem himself. And Hashem himself, after guaranteeing, after guaranteeing to Abba Mavinu that he will have a child, goes back on his word. Goes back on everything. And he says, offer your child to me. Kill him. But one second. Abba Mavinu could have said, but one second, we had an, we had an agreement over here. We had an agreement that he would, you would give me a son and you'd yell at me, and he would be in my inheritance. He would be in my inheritance. And from there would sprout all a new generation of, of believers in Hashem. And now you're taking that all away from me. But Hashem, you promised. What did, what did Abu Mavino said? You got it. Got up early in the morning, took Yitzhak with him, and he went up to the, to, he went up, and he bounded Yitzhak, and, and he was about to kill him. And it was no problem. And there was no problem. You know why? What was the street, secret, the, the secret strength of Amavino? Because he believed in Hashem. He believed that Hashem is everything that he does is for the good. He had no questions in his mind. Because he lived his life for Hashem, not for him. That's a huge difference between us and Avon Avinu. That's why Avon Avinu is unique individual. Abutai, we're here to understand Rosh Hashanah. In Rosh Hashanah, we make reference to the Shofar, to the Akedah Yitzchak, to Avon Avinu, his challenge of bringing up his child. But it's there to remind us of the psychology, of the uh, of the of what we should be thinking during Rosh Hashanah, how we coming to Rosh Hashanah with the right frame of mind. And that is the frame of mind of Avam Avinu. To have imuna and bitachon ba'ashem. It's as simple as that. No fear factor. No confessions. It's true that Yom Adin, But Hashem is not judging you in the same way way that we think he's judging us because we don't have a power of speech but rather he's judging us to see are you going to make me the king on this special day and what is a king a king is somebody that you give your entire life to without questions he tells you walk east you walk east walk west do this do that you just follow the orders whether there's logic to it or no logic that is a king and why? Because we understand that a king has... The reason why he's the king because he's very, very intelligent and he knows what he's doing. That is the challenge of Rosh Hashanah, that we should be mamlich HaKadosh Baruch Hu, making the king, meaning to give him power over our lives. Not with a checklist that we're going to Rosh Hashanah and saying, okay, Hashem, with the fear factor, you want me to do this, you want me to do that, and uh, you want me to, to fast, and you want me to put a chicken over my head, you want me to drink some honey, you want me to stand and uh, pray all day long for 20, 48 hours, whatever you want, Hashem, just do, but just give me my stuff that I need. That's not the way to come to Rosh Hashanah, because Hashem is judging us on this particular day. Are you going to make me the king? 
Meaning, are you going to relinquish your lives to me like Avraham Avinu? And we blow the shofar to remind us of this, that that is the point of life. We're not here running our own lives. We're here to serving Hashem. And that's a big difference. And that is the point of Rosh Hashanah. So we have these days of Elul that we are right now. We're preparing ourselves. But we're not here to get scared. But we're here to get our confidence back. We're here to have imuna v'bitachon b'ashem. And so when it comes to the Rosh Hashanah, we're going to be mamlich HaKadosh Baruch make him king. And instead of asking questions on our life, why we're not getting this, why we're not getting this, why that person's better, getting more, why is he more healthy, why is he more rich, why is he so and so forth, but rather having imuna b'bitachon b'ashem and having faith in Hashem that a king who knows us better than ourselves, who loves us better than ourselves, who loves our children more than we love our own children, that he's taking care of, he's running the show. And that's what Rosh Hashanah is all about. So we have a blessing, Bezat Hashem, we should be zochir to come into the Yemei Adin with courage and with simcha and with the love of Hashem and to nominate and coronate Hashem as the king have that philosophy in our minds the whole time. And Bezat Hashem, with that type of philosophy and Ashkafa in our, on our minds, Bezat Hashem, life will be much easier for us. And Hashem will send us all that we 